Hi! Welcome back to Fantasy Fiction Fanatics. This is going to be the first official uh, episode with content in it, so thank you for joining me. We're going to have the, uh, this episode is going to be doing the first five chapters of the book Dragons of Autumn Twilight, which is by Margaret Rice and Tracy Hickman. Hopefully you had a chance to read the first five chapters before this episode. If not, you're welcome to pause and quickly read them over or whatnot. Um, and just in case you didn't know, this book actually comes from uh, these the two authors when they met uh, working for the Dungeons and Dragons company, making the game and such. So that's actually how they first met and started writing books together. And this book, in particular, this book series is actually based off of the game world or um, of Dungeons and Dragons, which I find is kind of interesting. I don't really play the game at all. I only know a few basic things about it, and I know it takes a lot of time to prepare the game and play it. So if any of you do actually play the game or know a lot about the game and got a more in-depth experience because they, you know about the game, please let me know in the comments below um, exactly what changed, what you did know, what you got from it, how it differed, because uh, since I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure how much it affects the reading. So I'd love to hear uh, anybody who does know and got a different experience, uh, or a more in-depth experience, I should say, for, from knowing the game. So, all right, let's get started. I've got my trusty dusty notes today for what I hope to uh, cover and talk about. So. Hopefully you enjoy what I have come up with. All right, so I first just want to start with a brief recap of what we read, just to review in case it's been a couple days for you since you read it. So we start with the uh, prologue with, uh, with the old man coming to the inn in Solace, and he's rearranging the tables, and um, Tika's wondering if he's having a party or whatnot because he's kind of mysterious he's changing things around that are normally not changed so it's kind of an interesting beginning to start off with and then we transfer right to where Tannis, Flint, and Tass are all uh, finding each other on the road meeting up and they get attacked by a few master toad on the road which is very unusual to have the um, goblins in Solus. so they find that really interesting and they're a bit concerned about it and then we go to the inn together, um, they go to the inn together, and they meet some of their friends uh, when they get there, and eventually they all meet up, and we've got the two barbarians that come up uh, after they realize that the oath is broken from Kitiara not showing up, and we've got Gold Moon Song right afterward, you know, they, she sets up and uh, the old man convinces her to read it, uh, sing her song. We've got Tasseloff who hits the guy with the staff uh, after the old man gives it to him and tells him to whack him and when he's on fire and everything like that. Then they have to flee because of that and everyone's looking for the staff that they hit before and all of a sudden everything's going bonkers. They flee to Tika's house, but that doesn't last for long. They end up being found by um, some more goblins, which they ended up killing. And then again, they're fleeing for their lives through the forest to get to the boat and by the end, they are fly, uh, going away, barely escaped. And they see the constellations in the sky that are gone. All right, so sorry, that wasn't the best recap. I'm sure I will get better as the um, time goes. So hopefully I will be able to say it a bit better and more interestingly as we go along. All right, so... Let's make, I made a list uh, in my notes here of all the characters that we meet because it is a lot of characters for starting out a story. All right, so let's just go over them. We've got Flint, Fireforge, Tannis, Half Elven, we've got Tasseloff, Burfoot, Goldmoon, and Riverwind, Strum, Caramon, Razlin, Tika, the old man, and we have a mentioned Kitiara. So we've got a big cast already going into this story, which I think is actually pretty interesting. And it's going to be interesting to see how they keep up with giving all of the characters enough time to be developed and everything like that. And I think we'll be able to see how good um, that works out for the, the writers here. All right, so next I'd like to go over the list of characters. We do have several characters that are um, incorporated in these couple of chapters. 
that have to be kept straight and you're really uh, in just a couple of chapters they're introducing so many characters that you have to be developed and you have to start to know and are obviously going to be bigger characters since they are all traveling uh, um, together and in trouble together and they're all friends. So let's just go over all the names just so we make sure uh, we have all of them in our minds. We've got Flint Fireforge, the dwarf. We've got Tannis Half Elven, which obviously was the Half Elf. We've got Tasloff Burfoot, who was the Kender. We've got Goldmoon and Riverrune, who were the barbarians that came uh, with the next character, which is Strum, to the inn, and Strum is the knight. Caramon and Raslin was uh, were the twins that were already at the inn. We had Tika, who was the barmaid that they knew uh, from before they went on their journey. Uh, the old man who was in the prologue and in the uh, chapters at the inn. And we've got a mentioned Kitiara who was mentioned several times in the couple of chapters and is uh, kind of a big character with the oath being broken by her not showing up. So I figured even though she was just mentioned I would make sure we listed her off as one of a more main character since she does have a bigger presence. So let's start actually talking about the book. I think we should start with point of view because that is the first thing that is obvious when you read a book. You pick it up, you look at the first page, and you either see I, or we see he, she, they, that kind of stuff, or their names, or something like that. So obviously we're starting with a book that is in third person for this, which makes, in my opinion, makes sense that we have so many characters, it's hard to pick one character for it to be the point of view from. And it's also third person limited through most of it. Um, which means we don't really have an omniscient narrator that knows everything or whatnot. We ha no, have one character who, the, uh, who is explaining what's happening from their point of view. Um, and it changes. I don't know if you guys noticed this, but we do have a lot of changing of characters throughout these chapters. I didn't actually notice this before I started reading it um, this time. I never really noticed it before until I was looking for it. And I realized actually throughout the chapters the point of view changes a lot and I decided I started writing down um, how in my notes how often it changed and so even in the first chapter we start out with Flint and we see Flint coming down the road which uh, he's the only character so that would make sense why it would be from his limited point of view but then we have it start off that and once we get to page 14, it switches so smoothly that you almost don't notice that it switches to Tannis. And it becomes Tannis's point of view. And they, it comes more from what he's thinking, what he's feeling, how he's seeing things versus how Flint was seeing things. And that happens throughout all of the chapters. There's little bits and pieces where you get hints and um, bits and pe uh, those bits and pieces of those other characters and their thoughts in those particular moments. Most of the time it's from Tannis's point of view. But then we have these small switches where it switches to somebody and it switches back to him. And the next chapter it switches back and it switches to him. A couple times we even have a where it switches to being an omniscient narrator and then it pulls in to Tannis or one of the other characters. What do you think of that? Did you notice it? Um, I like I said, I didn't notice it from my other previous readings, but this time I noticed and I thought it was so interesting how they can make it so smooth that it's almost indetectable, and it's only detectable when you're looking for it. Um, so what does it do to have um, it to be in the third person? We have it in third person versus first person, and a first person is usually very personal. So we have it third person, which we already said, we have a lot of characters. So it makes sense why it would be um, a third person one. But what does it really do? How does it really affect the characters and the way we perceive the story? I find that with a book like this, it affects it in the fact that we see it more as a, uh, as a uh, person on the outside looking in. We are really aware that we are not in this story personally because that's what, how, where the eye comes from makes it very personal it makes it very 
in depth with the character, but this one, it leaves us enough apart that we know that we are looking in on this story. How do you feel about that? It's interesting. It's more of a personal question. That's not really a right or wrong answer on how it makes you feel, but it is something to keep in mind, especially if you are a writer trying to write books, is why do you want uh, someone to feel that way? What makes it appropriate versus something like a first person where you really want them to know, be involved, and almost feel like they are the character. I find it's, it makes this more like a movie. You're watching it and seeing it happen, which I find for Dragonlance and reading it several times is that I personally feel like it's a good choice to go with this kind of high fantasy and with the amount of characters that she's doing, uh, that they are doing, sorry. <laughs> and you can switch back and forth like they do not just between chapters, but also between uh, in the middle of the chapters. And it goes so smoothly that way that it's undetectable and it's just like you're still continuing to watch and you just get these tidbits here and there of other characters' thoughts that really contribute to what the author wants you to know. What are these tidbits exactly, though? I think we should look at um, a moment or two where we can see what they actually bring. Like if we are looking from another person's point of view, how it wouldn't work. So let me really quick find a section here. Let me look and see what I think would be a good one. Um, <laughs> let's go more toward the end. Let's go to chapter five when they're fleeing. So we've got Tannis's point of view to start off with. Until okay, so for me, we've got Tannis's point from chapter five, um, all the way up to page fifty-three, where we get to Strum's perspective. So we start off with Tannis. Let me read just a little bit. Um. Let's see. You're going to put all of us in one boat, Flint says in horror. You're mad, half-elf. It's a big boat, Tannis said. No, I won't go. If it were one of the legendary white-winged boats of Tar Tarsus, I, wouldn't, I still wouldn't go. I'd rather take my chances with the theocrat. Tannis ignored the fuming dwarf and motioned to Strum. Everyone, get everyone loaded up. We'll be along in a moment. Don't take too long, Strum warned. Listen. I can hear, Tannis said grimly. Go on. What are those sounds, Goldmoon asked the knight as he came up to her. Gold, uh, goblin search party, Strom answered. These, those whistles keep them in contact when they're separated. They're moving into the woods now. Goldmoon nodded in understanding. She spoke a few words to Riverwind in their own language, apparently continuing a conversation Strom had interrupted. And see, right there, we already know. It's a little bit before then, but it's that's when you definitely know we've stripped the switch to Strum's point of view because now it says Strum had interrupted. So before we were having Tannis ignore. So it's from his point of view. Now we have Strum had interrupted. But it's so seamless. But the tidbit that we get here is now instead of talking, seeing the bit with Tannis and Flint speaking to each other, we get the important part of interacting with the barbarians that Strum has. And that is the part that Tracy and um, and Margaret, there we go, wanted us to have. It's not really as important of what, at least uh, in their perspective, is they did not want us to know necessarily what Tannis and Flint were talking about. They want us to see this interaction between Strum and the barbarians. I'm going to read just a little bit more. The big plainsman frowned and gestured back toward the forest with his hand. He was trying to convince her to split with uh he's trying to convince her to split with us, Strum realized. Maybe he's not enough woods lore, uh woods lore to hide from goblin enough party uh search parties for days, but I doubt it. Um so then if we jump down, do 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 so we still have got more. He's talking to her, talking about her background. So that's what the important part is, the background between um her and Riverwind. We got, they're in the boat. Then on page, let's see where it says, page 55 is what I have written down here. Um, okay, then we have, 
next we go down and Tannis runs back up. We've got uh, Tannis patted Caramon on the back, then climbed in. The warrior pushed the boat out into the lake. He was up to his knees in water when they heard a call from the shore. Hold it! It was Flint running down from the trees, a vague motion, a big moving shape of blackness against the moonlit shoreline. Hang on, I'm coming! Stop, Tannis cried. Caramon, wait for Flint! Look, Strum half rose, pointing. Lights had appeared in the trees, smoking torches held by goblin guards. Goblins, Flint, Tannis yelled. Behind you, run! The dwarf never questioned, put his head down and pumped for the shore, one hand on his helm to keep it from flying off. I'll cover him, Tannis said, unslinging his bow. With his elven sight, he was the only one who could see the goblins behind the torches. Fitting an arrow to his bow, Tannis stood as Caramon held the big boat steady. Tannis fired at the outline of the lead goblin. The arrow struck it in the chest and it pitched forward on its face. So we can see that by going back to Tannis's perspective from Strums, is we get to see the part like we see the goblins rushing forward. We see him shooting them. We know what it's like and how no one else can because of his elven eyesight. So it's those kind of little tidbits that we get that allow the um, the switches to be so smooth but also important. So it's smooth because we get it to quickly change to this and it seems like it's effortless because we're adding information that we need. But then it's also important because we do need that information, if that makes any sense. They're both linked together and I find it very interesting that they can do it so smoothly. And as me personally as a writer, it's very hard to switch um, between different points of view and I often like the first point of view best because I like being really close up and personal with my character. I like feeling more in depth with it, but I find books like this it's you do feel in depth on it just because you see so many of the characters and it develops the characters helps bring their personalities out because you see a little bit here and there throughout the book not just through chapter to chapter but through sentence to sentence so just keep that in mind see if you have any comments for how you felt feel about it if you noticed it if you didn't notice it how uh if maybe in the future you'll have some notice of what you um get from it just let me know all right, my next thing I'd like to discuss is how this works as the start of a novel as well as the start of a series, since it is the start of both. How do we get pulled into this story? So first we start with the poem. And I'd like to look at the poem a little bit more in depth in general. Um, so let's read it together. It's really short, two pages mostly. So I'm going to read it really quick. Canticle of the Dragon. Hear the sage as his song descends, like heaven's rain or tears, and washes the years, the dust of the many stories from the high tales of the dragon lands. For in ages deep, past memory and word, in the first blush of the world, when the three moons rose from the lap of the forest, dragons terrible and great made war on this world of Crin. Yet out of the darkness of dragons, out of our cries for light, in the blank face of the black moon soaring, a blanketed light flared in Solomonia. A knight of truth and of power, who called down the gods themselves and forged the mighty dragon lands, piercing the soul of dragon kind, driving the shade of their wings from the brightening shores of Crin. Thus Huma, knight of Solomonia, light bringer, first lancer, Followed, followed his light to the foot of the Calchas Mountains, to the stone feet of the gods, to the crouched silence of their temple. He called down the lance makers he took on their unspeakable uh, power to crush the unspeakable evil, to thrust the coiling darkness back down the tunnel of the dragon's throat. Paladine, the great god of good, shone at the side of Huma strengthening the lance of his strong right arm, and Huma, ablaze in a thousand moons, banished the queen of darkness, banished the swarm of her shrieking hosts, back to the senseless kingdom of death, where their curses swooped upon nothing and nothing, down below the brightening land. Thus ended in thunder the age of dreams, and began the age of might, when Ishtar, kingdom of light and truth, arose in the east, 
where minarets of white and gold spired to the sun and to the sun's glory, announcing the passing of evil. And Istar, who mothered and cradled the long summers of good, shone like a meteor in the white skies of the just. Yet in the fullness of sunlight, the king priest of Istar saw shadows at the night. At night, he saw the trees as things with daggers, the streams blackened and thickening under the silent moon. He searched books for the paths of Huma, for scrolls, signs, and spells, so that he too might summon the god, might find their aid in this holy in his holy aims, might purge the world of sin. Then came the time of dark and death, as the gods turned from the world. A mountain of fire crashed like a comet through Istar. The city split like a skull in the flames. Mountains burst from their once fertile valleys. Seas poured into the graves of mountains. The desert sighed on abandoned floors of the seas, and highways of Crin erupted and became the paths of the dead. Thus began the age of despair. The roads were tangled. The winds and the sandstorms dwelt in the husks of cities. The plains and mountains became our home. As the old gods lost their power, we called to the blank sky into the cold dividing gray to the ears of, the, of new gods. The sky is calm, silent, unmoving. We have yet to hear their answer. It's pretty powerful in my opinion. Um, I'm not one for poetry. Uh, it's not really my forte or nor what I enjoy reading myself but this poem is really really powerful it seriously feels like legend <laughs> like a legend that we would have ourselves like a tale we would tell um, back in like folklore and things like that when we had oral traditions and it's it's amazing in my opinion very powerful very expressive and a good way to start this book because we've got already an idea of what we are looking at when we come into the book we see this when we read it we know already that this is going to be a high fantasy we see that this is going to be a powerful story with this world that's already crumbled we see that there are gods there are knights and we already get to be in the zone of where we're going to leave with the story. We're coming into it, we're saying, and they say, hey, this is the kind of story we're telling. This is how the land, this this legend, this amazing uh, night and, and during the times of old did this and now we've crashed and now we are where we're at now in this time of darkness. So hopefully me reading out loud gave you a little bit more of an impact. I know poetry is said to be better spread out loud, and I feel like myself reading it out loud felt much more powerful. So hopefully you enjoyed having that as an opening to your story. Um, I hope it puts you in the right mood. I hope that you felt the powerful, the, the folklore, the amazing energy that it helps you do to then come in to the prologue. So let's go to the prologue now. So the poem is really powerful. We see this legend. We know where we're at, what kind of story this is going to be, and then we turn to the old man and we actually start the story with Tika, <laughs> which is really an interesting start. We have like this big powerful poem and then we go to barmaid Tika. So with the prologue, we come to see the mysteries already starting to build. We already see the hints of danger, or at least the um, perceived hints of danger that are coming from Tika and Otik, where they look around and they're wondering, oh, will anybody hear us or whatnot? And you can already tell that the world is, like the poem said, it's been, let's double check what the wording is. The age of despair is the time that we are in. And so it makes sense that we are having this these hints of mysteries. And we see this old man who they already said just moments before that they would hear anybody that came up the steps, and yet they did not hear him. And that's like a little like, ding! That's interesting. What and who or who is this person? 
how did they not hear them? So that's the one hint of uh, about this person is that there's something up. And then he knows Tika's name, which is the other hint that they drop right before the prologue ends. So you focus on it. You can tell that there is something different about this person. So we're already stirring up the mysteries. We already are asking, uh, wanting to ask ourselves, or the book, who is this? What is going to happen? What is this person doing? And those are the exact questions that you want to be asking as uh, a beginning of a book or a series because you want to be intrigued. You want to find a reason to go to the next page. So obviously, as the start of with the, even just the poem and the prologue, we are already seeing them trying to entrance you. Then we also have, even from the first couple cha chapters, is that we see more of the mysteries accumulating. So not only do we have this old guy, but now we go to Flint. And we, as Flint and Tannis and Tass meet up, they get attacked by these goblins and they're like, well, when has this ever happened? This There's never been goblins in the um, area before. They're like, what is happening? We don't understand why we have this with Feud Master Toe there. And they're looking for a blue crystal staff. What exactly is a blue crystal staff? They want to know. We want to know. So we see the mysteries begin to accumulate. More and more danger, more and more questions needing to be answered. And it keeps us reading to the next page. Or at least it kept me reading to the next page. You can let me know if you have any other comments or concerns about that. Maybe you had a different reason that you liked reading it or a different um, interest. I believe even the beginning of the mysteries of who are these characters. You see them, uh, you see Flint and you see Tannis and you know that they're best friends, but you're like, what is the story behind it? Why are they just meeting up on this road and you already are hinted at how they haven't seen each other in a long time? Oh, here's Tass. This is an interesting person. Who is this? What is a kinder? Most people know what dwarves and elves are, but what is a kinder? Those different mysteries of the characters and events both combined are like, okay, what is happening? Where are we going to go next? And you turn the page and you want it now. All right. Beginning, also beginning at where the trouble starts is also important in this reading, which obviously they have captured. When you're reading a book, especially as a writer, you want to try and start the book right when the story is going to happen and something exciting is going to happen. Nobody wants to read five chapters of us getting to what the problem is. We want to start with some kind of problem. That's where your story really takes off and you're like, okay, this is going to interest the reader, is that this problem is happening and you want to find out what's next. So obviously Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman did a really good job with starting this off in um, an intriguing way that will make people draw in immediately to wanting to know what the world in the world is happening. All right, so let's see what our next question is. What will it be? All right, what? how do we understand the world and how do we believe the world and the characters in it? That is the two most important things in a book for a reader and for a writer. For a writer, how do you get your readers to understand and believe in your characters. And as a reader, we care about, hey, is this world interesting? Does it make sense? Do we want to continue with this world? Does it is it intriguing enough to contain it? As uh, our interest, as well as do the characters matter to us? Uh, as a reader, do we want to continue to read and see where these characters will go? How will they interact with this world? So, and they're very tied together because without a good world, you can't really have characters that you want to see interact with that world. If you don't have good characters, even if you have a great world, you don't really care about what the characters do in it. So it's really a, a to care, uh, something that's tied together and is, uh, has a good balance between the two. So for world building, the way that they have built this world in particular is um, they have left us hints and bits and pieces as they go along. They don't just say, hey, this is the whole history of everything that went down in this world. This is how the world works, point, 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 point. Which is, in any book, not just fantasy, but in any book, is important that they don't 
do so much exposition and so much explanation that you're just like okay let's just close the book now <laughs> we actually do want to get forward with the story as well as to understand the world so they do a really really good job with this in getting uh, us started in this world let me see so at first when we start with the prologue even we do have a little hints and, and pieces here so we are, are doing something that is uh, with Tika in this bar or whatever in this um, inn and we go and drop little things like when they're and they're talking like about the armies massing in the north and the thing uh, there are strange these strange hooded men in town so yes that's the building the mysteries but it's also building the world is that we have a world that has armies yes ours has armies as well but we already know from the prologue this is going to be more like a knight in shining army or uh knight in shining armor army there we go um, and we know that this is this inn is in a tree because we talks about the big stairs that you will hear anybody coming up from. So we already know this is a bit different from our world, but we're not really explaining it and we don't really have to in this scene because it's mostly a familiar item, which is the other thing that is um, really big in, in how we build this world is the familiar versus the unfamiliar. So we have a lot of familiar in this scene so we don't really have to worry too much but then we and when then we go into like the first chapter with flint and everything and they're walking down this road and we have hints and pieces here and they're like talking about how tannis is half elven and a little bit about how that his blood makes him different from everybody else so those are the hints and the pieces that are like okay let's build a little bit of the world build a little bit of the world we have mostly the familiar to start off with other than the poem that has like about the knight and the gods We've, we're starting with something that people know and we're just dropping little tiny hints as long we go along here and there like okay have a little bit of what this world is have a little bit of what this world is while keeping you the or as a reader comfortable enough that you can continue forward and be like okay I already know that this world is going to make sense in some way it's going to be familiar to me enough with my experiences in the real world to understand how things are going to work in this fantasy world. And then we get a little bit more once we reach um, number two, uh, chapter two. We've got this whole beginning section that is all explanation about the city. So let's, uh, let me read just a little bit of it. Nearly everyone in Solus managed to drop into the inn of the last home. Sometime during the evening hours these days, people felt safer in crowds. Solus had been a crossroads for travelers. They came uh, northeast from Haven, the seeker capital. They came from the elven kingdom of Quelanesti to the south. Sometimes they came from the east across the barren plains of Abenicia. Throughout, uh, Abenicia. Throughout the civilized world, the inn of the last home was known as a traveler's refuge and center for news. It was the inn that the three friends turned their steps. So we start this chapter by saying a little bit about the world this is a place for travelers and we've got a little bit of examples of these different types of travelers so we know that uh we're already starting to build this world of these different places we've got the elves and Qualanisti. we've got a seeker capital so even though we don't know totally what a seeker is we understand that there is another set of people that have this capital that come through here and it's giving you these um hints of these are the kind of things in this world of course, also the fact that the, the uh, Solus is a tree city, which they also explain a little bit in this chapter is everything is in the trees. And the reason why also builds the world. We're slowly putting together the pieces of what is similar to our world and what is different from our world. Obviously, having um, kinder and these people are different. But they don't really feel like they need to explain it because you're going to know as we go along with the different hints, we don't have to explain it right away. We have enough familiar with building on the unfamiliar until finally we get to Raslin. Let's see. When we get to Raslin in the inn, we start to see the really unfamiliar and the fact that this person ha is physically different than anybody that could ever exist today. We've got... Let's see if I can see it where we're at. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Sorry, forgive me. I just got to find the page. 
that I want to go from. Okay, so he recoiled, uh, uh, Tannis recoils back in, in uh, fear, and we've got the, the face that turned toward him from the shadows was a face out of a nightmare. Changed, Caramon had said, Tannis shuddered. Changed wasn't the word. The white, the mage's white skin had turned a golden color. It glistened in the firelight with a faintly metallic quality, looking like a gruesome mask. The flesh had melted from the face, leaving the cheekbones outlined in dreadful shadows. The lips were pulled tight in a dark line, uh, straight line. But it was the man's eyes that arrested Tannis and held him pinned in their terrible gaze. For the eyes were no longer the eyes of any living human Tannis had ever seen. The pu black pupils were now the shape of hourglasses. The pale blue irises Tannis remembered now glittered gold. So this is one of the bigger chunks of, hey, no one's ever going to have pupils that are hour shaped but in this world there is and we've had enough of a believability enough of things that we understand to say hey now we can understand uh, we can take in the stuff that we don't understand because we understand everything else now we can say hey it's okay if we don't understand this hey okay this is a part of this particular world all this i understand now i'm trying to fit in this other piece from this other um this other world. So as for character development, there are several different things that we uh, as an author do to relate um, a character's personality and feelings and things like that to the audience. The first thing is dialogue. Dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. Uh, dialogue is everywhere, obviously. It's throughout the whole thing. It's people interacting with each other and that is a key to their their personality because of two things how they say it and what they say. What they say shows, hey, this is what this person thinks and feels about this world. They, they're saying it and that shows their perception of it, their thought processes that they are trying to relate to somebody else. That's the main thing that dialogue is, is we our thoughts and we're trying to communicate them to somebody else. So every single piece of dialogue is a person's thought they're trying to communicate to another character. So it is very important on what they say. Now, how they say it is also important because with the taglines like he hissed or she said or they yelled or whatever else is because that also adds another layer to what they are saying. This is their thoughts and this is how they think about it. So both of the dual aspects of dialogue is really important with uh, developing and figuring out a character. So that is very important to be looked at. And uh, especially with, I find in this book with Raslin, they really intonate his different things, like with the he hissed um, items. Let me see if I can find a little, uh, that section that I'm thinking of really quick. Here we go. Raslin stared at him, then his lips parted uh, in a caricature of a grin. He withdrew his hand from Tannis' arm and folded his arms in the sleeves of his robe. Of course, the mage hissed. Power is what I have long sought and still seek. That hissed in the middle is showing you exactly how he's saying it. It's a powerful, uh, the power is what he wants. And it's the way he intonates it is showing how he feels about that power, how he wants it. He's hissing it like he's trying to attack Tannis with it. So it's very, very interesting to, to study the dialogue. And as we move forward, we will talk more about dialogue uh, in general. I just wanted to touch on it today to have us looking at it in the future to, um, as you continue to read, to think about how is, is it developing these characters? How is it affecting them? How are we supposed to take uh, everything that uh, say, certain things that they say? All right, so the next thing is actions. And actions speak louder than words, as the saying goes. And in many ways in novels, that is true because you have a lot more action than you do dialogue. The majority of a book is made up of describing the world and the actions that people take versus what they are saying. So the actions in many ways do speak louder than the words of the dialogue. Um, for uh, the reason that the, uh, the actions are also important is because 
they are an unconscious thing. Uh, dialogue is a character thinking something and they're trying to portray it to somebody else. They're thinking about it and trying to get it across to another character. So it's a little bit different in the way that it works with actions. It's all about pure instincts or the way they feel about something moves them to do this on a more unconscious level. So you really see the ingrained portion of their personality and their thoughts and their feelings by the way that they act through instinct. Obviously sometimes it's thought of and there are times in here that you hear their thoughts and they think of things, but a lot of their actions is just based on their personality. So their actions are really uh, important in understanding their personality. For example, we have tasks stealing from his friends. Then obviously we learn that most kinder have this affliction and they would never consider themselves to be a thief, though I'm sure all his friends seriously think it anyway, especially Flint, right? <laughs> so the thing about it is that the, his action, though he thinks of it as one way, shows another thing. He doesn't think of himself as a thief, but if something catches his interest, it ends up somehow in his pouch. And that action shows his personality. And that's just an ingrained portion of who the Tass is. Without the stealing, he would not be Tasseloff Burfoot. He would not be the character that we have read in the pages of these stories. And in my opinion, grown to love over my many times of reading it. I hope that once you read him and understand more about him, you will fall in love with him just as much as me. Um, so another action uh, is that they're friends. They don't hold it against him. They don't act meanly to him. And those actions of kindness toward him show that they accept him on his level of uh, stealing and like who he is. They don't hold it against them. They don't um, tr uh, be begrudge him for it. They're still friends anyway because they treat him just as kindly. And though they do have to work around a little bit on uh, not hugging him so they don't have something to be stolen, um, they still remain good friends and travel with him and protect him as much as they can. So that those actions also speak in um, innumerable ways as you read the development of these characters. So again, for today, I just wanted to bring these different aspects up since we are starting the novel and just to keep those things in mind so that way later we can maybe uh, go a little bit more in depth on the way actions and dialogue have uh, been incorporated and uh, how that affects our understanding of these different characters. All right, the next question is going to be, are we intrigued? This is basically a not right or wrong answer. It's just a your own personal opinion, but I think it's an important one because as all, either, uh, all authors, I'm sure all of them want you to be intrigued enough to keep reading, otherwise they'd be out of a job. <laughs> so that's an important thing as well as a reader because you want to be intrigued, you want to like it, you want to be able to um, feel the feeling of flipping to the next page and being like, what is happening? Where are we going? What kind of adventure are we starting out on? Um, i really like you to comment uh, in the comments below and uh, tell me how you feel about it and if the first five pages have intrigued you and what things you expect or may not expect to happen. Um, personally, my opinion is I am very intrigued. Even when I first read it, it uh, instantly hooked me even back when I was in middle school and I first read it. And even now, I keep thinking, hey, I forgot this little detail. Hey, I remember this. I remember this is leading to this. I can't wait till I get to that portion. So even reading it, uh, many times I get the feeling of, hey, I don't remember this. Where does this lead to? Or, hey, I do remember this. Let's see where it goes. So whether you've read it one time or many, the uh, Margaret Rice and Tracy Hayman, in my opinion, really capture your attention and make you want to keep flipping the page. All right, now let's get down to the nitty gritty of the individual events and things like that and actually talk about the uh, aspects of what's happening in the story. Thank you so much for staying with me through the beginning of this episode, um, or will I say uh, two-thirds of the episode, where we're going over kind of the beginning things. I, as a first episode of reading these books, I kind of just wanted to go over these different aspects. That way later, as we move along, I won't have to talk so much about them. We can just more incorporate them into our discussion as something we already are thinking about and wondering about. So, 
hopefully it's just a one-time thing and then we will be able to just in the future get more into the nitty-gritty portions and that will be the main portion of our discussion so thank you again for making it this far and um in my opinion the first main event that i feel like is big enough to really talk about especially since it's the beginning we don't have too much happening as of yet is gold moon song which in my book uh happens on page 34 uh yep 34 so and it's actually a pretty long song uh in terms of pages it's a good page and a half almost and uh, it really explains the though we don't know it right away it, uh, not until the uh, fifth chapter where uh, Strum's helping her into the boat about this song is uh, a real life event for her that has happened before she got here so let's go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and read it the grasslands are endless and summer sings on and Gold Moon the princess loves a poor man's son. Her father, the chieftain, makes long roads between them. The grasslands are endless, and summer sings on. The grasslands are waving, the sky's rim is gray. The chieftain sends Riverwind east and away to search for strong magic at the lip of the morning. The grasslands are waving, the sky's rim is gray. O Riverwind, where have you gone? O Riverwind, autumn comes on. I sit by the river and look to the sunrise, but the sun rises over the mountains alone. The grasslands are fading, the summer wind dies. He comes back, the darkness of stone in his eyes. He carries a blue staff, as bright as a glacier. The grasslands are fading, the summer wind dies. The grasslands are fragile, as yellow as flame. The chieftain makes mockery of river wind's claim. He orders the people to stone the young warrior. The grasslands are fragile, as yellow as flame. The grassland has faded, and autumn is here. The girl joins her lover, the stones whistle near. The staff flares in blight, blue light, and both of them vanish. The grasslands are faded, and autumn is here. I don't know about you guys, but every time there's a song in a book, I always try to fit a melody to them, and I could not fit a melody to this uh, poem of a song, and it was really driving me nuts because I really wanted to try and sing it. I don't know. Do you guys do that? Comment in the comments below if you guys do that too. Where you read it and it says it's a song and you try to make a song to it. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm just weird. So anyway, I find that this is one of the main events because uh, it's really getting to um, a, a deep place for a character rather quickly. We see um, their story and things like that. And even though it's your first time reading it and you're not sure that it happens for real, it you, you can assume based on uh, her saying her own name in there, that it's probably a story of herself. So the thing I think that makes this a turning point is it makes it a little bit more serious. I don't know if it's the right word about it, but it, it kind of is. Like before we were passing along, and yes, we did have the few master toad and we have this mystery and things like that, but this is here is where we are getting to uh, a more meatier section of of the story. First we just have their walking along. Now we're getting to more, these are where events are starting to happen. And this poem stands out from the regular text. We've got just regular things happening and all of a sudden we've got this story. We've got this song that is coerced out of Gold Moon. And though we don't know her, we don't know what's gonna happen with her, it's, there's a reason that the authors made it stand out and it makes it um, come to life off the page because we've got uh, the, it in a poem form. It is a song. Sorry, I know I'm repeating myself. I'm trying to get to what I'm actually trying to think of and tell you. Um, so please bear with me. Hopefully as these videos go on, I will get better at getting to the point a bit quicker and not repeating myself so much. So making it stand out is just a way to signal that something is about to happen. We are about to make something happen. We've got this song. It's ominous. It's deep. We have a feeling that we are going to be entwined with these characters because it is here. Um, because otherwise a reader's going to be like, well, why do we have this here? And so it's almost like a signal to what's going to happen right after this with uh, the high theocrat. And it is what sparks the High Theocrat being angry and being caught on fire, which is the next thing I was hoping to talk about. 
And so it basically it ties in together. This song leads up to the danger. We've got this ominous song and then ominous things happen from it. So we've stopped, we've, we're, we've stopped our action. Here's the song. We've got this feeling of doom and like, uh, and that you're not really sure what's going on a little bit. And then we've got, bam, high theocrat is on fire. Is that how you say it? It's a theocrat. Let me double check. Yeah, theocrat. Um, and he trips over. It's nobody's fault even. It's his own fault. He's so drunk. He trips over into the fire because he's so angry about um, the song. And now he's ablaze, screaming off the top of his lungs. And this is where, the again, the old man is intriguing. He, beco he becomes more... He, he made her sing the song. He begged her to sing the song. She got and got her to do it. And now he is in the middle of this situation. He tell, uh, he hands the staff, Gold Moon staff, to Tass, who has come over because the guy's on fire, of course. Because who else would not be interested to see a guy, a guy on fire? Of course, Tass has to be in the middle of it. He hands Tass the, uh, the staff and tells him, Hit him with it! Hit him with it! Like, let's see if we can actually read this part. I think it's actually hilarious the way uh, the old man acts. Um, there was a whoosh and a flare of light, then a sickening smell of burning flesh. Theocrat's scream tore through the sun's silence as the crazed man leaped to his feet and started whirling around in a frenzy. He became a living torch. Let's skip the next paragraph to here. The old man grabbed the barbarian's feather decorated staff and handed it to the kinder. Knock him down. Then we can smother the fire. Tasseloff took the staff. He swung it using all his strength and hit the theocrat squarely in the chest. Let me stop right there for a second. What kind of reasoning is hitting him with a staff to smother him? Like... Yes, I mean, you don't want to touch him because you he's on fire. You don't want to catch on fire either. But what makes you think to just grab this staff to tell him to knock him out so we can do it? So to me, it's a little bit odd. Maybe it wasn't to you. I'd love to hear your opinion on it. Um, but to me, I'm like, just imagine he's like, he just happens to grab that staff that she was just seemingly to be singing about him, uh, Riverwind bringing. He grabs it and hands it to Tass. He doesn't hit it himself. He hands it to Tass instead of himself, and it's like, okay, that's kind of odd, too. If you, it's your idea, why aren't you hitting the guy that's on fire? Um, hits him squarely in the chest. So something's already odd about that. Let's continue. The man fell to the ground. There was a gasp from the crowd. Tassloff himself stood, open-mouthed, the staff clutched in his hand, staring down at the amazing sight at his feet. The flames had died instantly. The man's robes were whole, undamaged his skin was pink and healthy he sat up a look of fear and awe on his face he stared down at his hands and his robes there was not a mark on his skin there was not the smallest cinder smoking on his robes it healed him the old man proclaimed loudly the staff look at the staff okay so the old man grabs the staff hands it specifically to Tass. Tass knocks him down and it instantly heals him so first of all that part we're like, oh my gosh, it healed him. What's going on? What is the staff? What is happening? Is it the staff? Is it the kinder? Is it what? Because we don't know enough about the story to understand what could have happened. All we know is that some of that combination has uh, has made it so that way this person is healed. But then specifically the old man's behavior, again, you're just like, hmm, because he says it healed him. The staff, look at the staff. So he instantly says it heals him and he automatically assumes it's the staff. He automatically knows it's the staff and he's looking at it and seeing it. Then when Tess looks up he, to see the staff, it's blue crystal, which we already know we've heard about a blue crystal staff earlier in the chapters. So we've got this blue crystal staff glowing bright blue light. The old man began shouting, call the guards. Arrest the kinder, arrest the barbarians, arrest their friends. I saw them come in with this knight, he pointed at Strum. And you're just like, what happened? This guy not only gave this staff 
to Tass. He knows it wasn't his staff. He grabbed it from the barbarians. And now he's saying, everyone, arrest them all. We're, nobody leave no man behind. Um, call the guards. He's Now he's the one that's going to be charging up the, uh, the um, what's the phrase? Um, the something mob. You know what I mean? Um, and so you're just like, what is this old guy doing? He was be weird before and now he's still weird. And you're like, something is obviously, th this is the hint that obviously this guy is more than it's he seems. We don't know who he is. We don't know what his role is yet, but obviously he is doing something on purpose. And then, and, and ta uh, Tannis even sees this. He says, what? Tannis leaped up. Are you crazy, old man? He his self too he knows that he gave Tass the staff so why is he saying to arrest them um so then again this is what starts everybody saying oh call the guards call the guards and it forces them to be on the run so we already know that this is planned this is preordained by this old man whoever that is going uh, is because he's the one that set it up it's quite clear that he's framed them he and when you think about it, okay, so they've pushed this table to the wall. He, he's the one that pushed the table to the wall by the fire. And he was supposed to be having this party of some sorts. And he even said there was going to be a party. And he had the chair that River, uh, Gold Moon and Riverwind sit at moved to the fire where he would be already placed in his big comfy chair. So we do know that whoever this is... Um, has started this mob, lynch mob, there we go, lynch mob, after uh, Tannis and the company, including the barbarians. Um, so instantly we've got danger and intrigue and we're going on an adventure. Here's where the adventure really, really starts. All right, next thing I want to discuss is the actual blue crystal staff. The staff is almost like the old man. The staff is originally a nondescript brown staff. Nothing special, nothing amazing. It has a, feather, a couple feathers on it from the barbarians placing it on there. But it's not anything that stands out. It's not something that Razlin looked at. And we already know that he has a staff and that he is a magic user. So you would assume that he would know about staffs. But he doesn't say anything about it. And all of a sudden it touches this man. It heals him completely. And now it's a blue crystal. And it's the staff that everyone seems to be asking about. It's what is so it's so dangerous they want to search any travelers for it everyone mentions that they get stopped being asked about it so why it is this so important obviously it healed this man but what is it what is the staff really it's hidden in disguise this old man seems like it's uh he's not that big of a deal but all of a sudden he's got a lynch mob hanging after them and that's the same way that the staff is so i find it I find the staff interesting, and even at the beginning, um, knowing what's going to happen and things like that, I'd really like to talk about the new feeling of what the crystal staff is, what the enigma of it is, and where we think it's going to be going. Um, in the comments below, I'd love it if you would comment on what you think. Uh, the staff is going to be leading toward and why everybody wants it. But it was, what do even people need for a healing staff, right? Normally you just kill everybody. So what do they need it for? Uh, it's a really good question. I uh, have not read it, read it soon enough to totally remember. Uh, so we'll discover together, which is always fun to rediscover things, even though you've read it before. All right. Uh, along with that, uh, is this part in ch chapter, I think it's four, three, four. Let me see. Let me check my notes here. Um, four. There we go. Page 44. This gives us a hint toward the staff, at least in from Raslin's knowledge, is he makes this comment. Let's see where we go. 
So uh, he try so he grabs the staff from Goldmoon because he's interested in it, and it uh, he cries out in pain. It's burning him. He drops it, and he says, um, "Tannis says, what is it then?" Tan uh, Tannis asked in exasperation. A staff that heals and injures at the same time. It merely knows its own. Raslin licked his lips, his eyes glittering. Watch, Caramon, take the staff. Not me, the warrior drew back as if from a snake. Take the staff, Raslin demanded. Reluctantly, Caramon stretched out a trembling hand. His arm twitched as his fingers came closer and closer. Closing his eyes and gritting his teeth in anticipation of pain, he touched the staff. Nothing happened. Caramon opened his eyes wide, startled. He gripped the staff, lifted it in his huge hand, and grinned. See there, Raslin gestured like an illusionist showing off a trick to the crowd. Only those of simple goodness, pure in heart, his sarcasm was biting, may touch the staff. It is truly a sacred staff of healing, blessed by some god. It is not magic. No magic objects that I have ever heard about have healing powers. So we do get a little insight on at least what we propose it is. Um, but the mystery is still huge. What God? Where did it come from? What's going on with it? Why does everybody want it? How does anybody else know about it? Um, as well as it's interesting that it burns Raslin and the fact that what does that mean that Raslin is? Obviously, he's saying he's not a simple goodness and pure heart, which is already obviously true. He's in love with power. But what then do we know about Raslin because he cannot touch the staff? So the staff has multiple features to it. Where it's showing off Raslin as well as it's adding all this mystery. And it's really... The starting point of our story is this staff. We have this meeting, but without this staff and without uh, Tass hitting that per, uh, the Thai theocrat who was on fire up, uh, with it, this story and this adventure could not take place. So it, the whole root of the staff is our starting point for our adventure. So I think that'll be interesting to see how it progresses that we have this starting point and will that continue to be the catalyst for our adventure? Or will it change as the uh, story progresses? We're going to have to see how that goes. All right, one last point I'd like to do is the um, missing constellations, which is at the very, very, very end of our little section of reading here. But it's an important one, uh, not just because it's a chapter ending, which is a good chapter ending considering you're just like, what the heck? Um, it's because of the proclamation that uh, Raslin has about it. First we see... It through Gold Moon's eyes that she gasps and she recognizes that they're gone. But it's Raslin who says that they're gone. Um, the valiant warrior and the queen of darkness. Now let's see. Gone, rasped Raslin and lapsed into a fit of coughing. Caramon put his arm around him, holding him close, almost as if the big man were trying to hold his brother's frail body together. Raslin recovered, wiping his mouth with his hand. Tannis saw that his fingers were dark with blood. Raslin took a deep breath, then spoke. The constellation known as the Queen of Darkness and the one called Valiant Warrior, both gone. She has come to Kryn Tannis, and he has come to fight her. All the evil rumors we have heard are true. War, death, destruction. His voice died in another fit of coughing. So this is the biggest chunk we've got yet. Um, it is dropped at the end of a chapter because obviously they want to leave it on a little bit of a cliffhanger. And obviously, uh, Caramond is trying not to, um, or at least he doesn't seem to believe it, and Tannis is trying to make it like he doesn't believe it. But we've got this big chunk of this is where the story seems like it might be going. What does that mean? These two constellations are gone and they've come to Earth. So what is this going to mean? What does this lead to? It's a big question. It leads it to the big question is what is it? And it is... Um, whether you've read the story or not, you can already tell that this is going to be the foreshadowing of what is to come. Because why would they mention this? Why would Ras be so certain if it's just as Caramon says and they are a bunch of stars? And what does Goldmoon know about it? We still don't know what Goldmoon knows about it. Obviously she knew what it meant, but what does it mean to her and the people of um, the Plains people that she comes from? So... 
It's a very small uh, part that we're ending on, but it's going to lead up to where we're going. So I really wanted to touch on it and just have everyone comment below on what you think this means and what you hope it or hope it means or what you want it to mean, whatever um, uh, whatever you want to make a comment on for about it. Uh, it's very interesting how the sky uh, has these constellations and they can just dis disappear. And only Raz and Gold Moon knew about it. They are the only ones that, uh, when they looked up, could tell what was going on. So we will see how it progresses in the next set of chapters. So for next week, I'd like you to read chapters 6 through 10, which in my volume is pages 59 through, let me get to it, 116. So I did the math, it's about the same, uh, it's about 58 uh, pages again, uh, same five chapters. So hopefully if you read one chapter a day, it shouldn't be too bad. And now you have a full seven days to be able to skip a couple days if need be. So let me know how I did on this video, what I need to work on, how what you liked, what you didn't like, where I should uh, try and go with it from here because I'd really like your guys' feedback on my teaching as well as on my ideas and to hear your ideas. I'd really love to hear everything that you think and feel that was either incongruent or um, completely opposite of what I had to say. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you Wednesday for our uh, character episode on Albus Dumbledore. See ya!